Oh, just before we get started with the Mega Projects video today, guess what? It's brought to you by Skillshare, which is an online learning community for creators with thousands of classes in design, business, and more. Two months of free premium membership for the first 500 people who click below. More on them in a bit. Anyway, today we're talking about the Trans Siberian Express, which is this train which basically goes all the way, I think, from Moscow to Asia. We're gonna learn all about it today. This is something I've actually wanted to do for a very long time. I seriously looked into it, doing it about 10 years ago, but then life happens, and today I'm like, well, I'm probably never taking that trip. But maybe someday I will. If you've been on it, let us know how it is in the comments below, and let's just dive in, shall we? When we think about great train journeys, there's a good chance that one particular one springs to mind. The longest train line in the world stretches to an enormous 5,772 miles, just over a fifth of the circumference of the entire Earth. And of course, we're talking about the Trans-Siberian Railway. There is certainly a romanticism to this mammoth railway that winds across Russia, crossing eight different time zones along the way. It's not just the mind-boggling distances involved, but it's also the layers of history and drama that have unfolded along this railway since it first opened all the way back in 1903. It is a railway line that has not only come to define a country, but one that has helped to build it. Those boarding a Trans-Siberian Express train in Moscow and traveling the full distance face seven days of continuous train travel ahead of them. There is quite simply nowhere else on Earth that can offer this kind of experience. The term Trans-Siberian can be a little misleading and is often used to describe other routes as well. So before we go on to the technicalities and its history and all of that jazz, let's take a quick look at its various lines. Okay, so there are three main lines that form the bulk of the rail system commonly grouped together and called Trans-Siberian. While they all use the same stretch of railway for much of the distance, you really wouldn't want to get on the wrong train in Moscow because you're going to end up about 830 miles from where you want to go. That's the distance between the two potential endpoints. Be slightly worse than falling asleep on the train on your way home from work or the pub as I've done a couple of times. This is a subject that we could spend hours talking about, so for the sake of brevity, we're just going to focus entirely on the official Trans-Siberian line. That is the one that you think of when someone says Trans-Siberian Express. The flagship Trans-Siberian route stretches from Moscow across the vast, vast Siberian wilderness before finishing in Vladivostok on the Pacific coast. But this is not the longest route that uses the railway, only coming in in third position. In case you're wondering, the two longer routes are from Moscow to Pyongyang in North Korea, a route coming in at 6,380 miles, and also the Kiev to Vladivostok route, which is 6,888 miles. Both of these travel on the Trans-Siberian for most of their journeys, but are not considered single lines as part of the journeys use different rail networks. There is also the trans manchurian Manchurian route, which connects Moscow and Beijing with its trains following the Trans-Siberian route until Chita, which is around 3,700 miles from Moscow, where it breaks away and heads south into China. And I know these are not technically the same route, but it is insane that you can get on a train in Moscow and get off a train, I mean, different train, but on rail all the way to, well, either Beijing or Pyongyang. Amazing. Finally, there is the Trans-Mongolian connecting Moscow with Ulaanbaatar, the Mongolian capital, before continuing into China and finally culminating in Beijing. Again, it follows the Trans-Siberian line for much of the way before breaking from it at Ulan Ude and heading south. And thinking about all of this, I think about, you know, okay, so you get to the train in Beijing and you can hop on another train that could take you probably all the way south, all the way to Vietnam, all the way down to Cambodia. I mean, so essentially, all of those rail lines are, are sort of connected. Incredible. Now, if you think we have travel problems today, spare a thought for Russia during the 18th and 19th centuries. This is not simply an absurdly large country, it's also one that experiences the kind of winters that would bring practically any nation on Earth to a standstill, or, well, any army for that matter, famously. 
The problem of connecting the Russian population and also providing a durable way to trade with China was absolutely enormous. Until the mid-19th century, most journeys across the area had been done by boat, mainly along the Siberian river routes. A patchwork of roads had been used as early as 1730, but it was only in the 19th century that this road route was significantly improved and extended down into Mongolia and eventually into China. This was commonly called the Tea Road, which attested to the vast quantities of highly prized Chinese tea, no surprises there, that made its way along the road across Russia to the thirsty consumers in the West. And I like to imagine most of it ended up in England, where we drink an absolute ton of tea. But the Russian Far East was a world away from the more populated areas of Western Russia. The Russians had only reached the Pacific in 1647, and even after that, vast swaths remained unexplored and just virtually empty. The local population relied heavily on grain and other food imports from China and Korea, rather than from their own country. And there was a fear among the Russians that the Far East was, well, you know, not very Russian. By the end of the 19th century, the Russian government saw this is enough of an issue that plans were finally drawn up for what would become the Trans-Siberian Railway. A railway that would once and for all connect this vast country and help Russia to industrialize Siberia and the rest of the Far East and also, you know, make him a bit more Russian. In May 1891, the Tsarevich, the name given to the Tsar's sons, and who would later become Tsar Nicholas II, inaugurated the project in Vladivostok. Perhaps the most important figure in the entire project was this guy, Count Sergei Witte, although he was a Georgian of Dutch descent. Anyway, he was a man who worked his way up from the bottom. He started by selling train tickets, but he was now in the role of Russian Director of Railway Affairs and was in charge of perhaps the most significant engineering project that Russia had ever Ever seen. Witte was known as neither a liberal nor a conservative, and because of this, it was thought he could cut through the bureaucratic red tape. By persuading Tsar Alexander III to place his son Nicholas II in charge of the project, Witte not only gained the vital royal seal of approval, but also a young boss who he could felt he could more easily persuade on certain matters. From 1892, he also became the finance minister and set about raising further funds for the railway through increased taxation, loans, and according to some, simply printing rubles. That's always a good way to fund state constructions. When not really. When the final section of the line was completed, the estimated cost in 1916 dollars was thought to be between $770 million and $1 billion in 1916 dollars. That today is between $19.9 billion and $25.9 billion dollars. This was an amount that represented a fifth of Russia's entire national debt at the time for building a railway line. The enormous distances meant that it was much more feasible to construct different parts of the line simultaneously. With this in mind, the line was broken into several different sections and work began in sync on most of them. In terms of people who worked on this, an absolutely incredible 62,000 men were working on the different sections all over the country. Some sections laid as much as 372 miles of track every year. As a comparison, 26 years earlier, the Union Pacific Railroad in the United States, which would eventually form part of the Transcontinental Railroad, laid just 40 miles of track in its first six months. But just before we jump to any conclusions about speed, the standard of much of the line laid across Russia was just not very good. Parts of the line were just not very well surveyed. Uh, green timber was also being used, which essentially is a young wood that hasn't been given time to season. Not a good time. Basically, it sometimes shrinks as it gets older. And, well, that's not something you want on a train line. Further, many of the rails and sleepers were too light, which caused numerous derailments, while the rickety wooden bridges, often quickly thrown together, did not provide enough support. As recently as 2018, a bridge near Svobodny in Amur Oblast collapsed, thankfully not while a train was passing across it though. Anyway, even after its completion, much of the line just needed to be relayed, and it just remains this ever ongoing project. It feels kind of like motorways in the UK. <laughs> Just never quite done. The line officially reopened in the summer of 1903, but at this point, it was still not completely linked. Several parts of the line still needed to use boats to cross rivers or lakes. The mighty Lake Bakal, with its 400 mile length, lay on the route. Until the Circumbikal Railway was completed in 1905, the Trans Siberian ended on either side of the lake, with the carriages being transported across by two train ferries. 
Didn't even know that was a thing. That's pretty cool. In the harsh winter of 1903 and 1904, the ice was so thick that the train ferries couldn't break through it. Not to be thwarted, though, a temporary railway line was just laid directly over the ice, and the carriages were pulled across it using horses. Anyway, the Circumbikal, the railway that went around it, was considered the most demanding of the seven sections. Skirting around the lake, passing through 33 tunnels and over more than 100 bridges and viaducts, it is a marvelous train journey and an incredibly impressive engineering feat. Much of the work was carried out by inmates of the Alexandrovsky prison. Nothing like free labor. The final piece of this vast jigsaw was the Khabarovsk Bridge over the Amur River near the city of Khabarovsk in eastern Russia. After significant delays caused by the outbreak of World War I, it finally opened in 1916 and stretched a total of 1.6 miles. At the time, it was considered a technical marvel, and it remains the longest bridge in Russia for many years. But the use of the bridge lasted lasted just five years, as it became one of the victims of Russia's bloody civil war, which we're gonna get to in a minute. But before we do get to that, well, I gotta tell you about today's fantastic sponsor, Skillshare. Now, unlike some websites with online classes where you have to pay individually, with a premium membership from Skillshare, you get unlimited access, so you can take as many classes as you want. This is pretty nice. Now, I'm someone when I want to learn something, I'm just going to jump into, you know, I see a class, it's like, oh, the class is like two hours, but I just need like part 17, section three. And it's like, oh, well, on other websites, you have to buy the whole course just to get that one part. With Skillshare, I just look at it. And I'm like, okay, perfect. That solves the problem in like uh, Adobe Premiere or whatever I'm using to make a video. I need to learn about that or like that specific lighting thing. I read about this huge light that I'm using to film these videos on Skillshare. This is why it's so great. You just jump in. It's like, a buffet of classes. I've talked about some classes I've taken on there before. As I just mentioned, I've taken some Premiere classes. Uh, I've also taken a class on email productivity from Alexandra Samuel. Well worth checking out. There's another one built on building good habits with Thomas Frank. Both of those are great. Thomas Frank's also a YouTuber, by the way. Worth checking out, but definitely get his course on Skillshare. Anyway, join more than 7 million creators learning with Skillshare. Skillshare are giving away two free months of premium membership to help you guys explore your creativity. All you have to do is click the link below. That's for the first 500 people only. And it's super affordable after that at around $10 a month if you pay for it annually. Like I say, first 500 people only, two months premium for free. There is a link below and let's carry on with the video. Once opened, the train service swelled quickly to capacity, but mostly with the movement of goods, especially wheat. Between 1896 and 1913, the Siberian region exported an average of half a million tons of grain and flour annually, all being moved west to feed those hungry masses. The transformation of the Siberian region was truly extraordinary. Between 1896 and 1904, the annual number of migrants heading to Siberia, or the Russian Far East, doubled to 88,000. And that number doubled again to 174,000 each year between 1905 and 1914. Roughly 2.5 million peasants migrated to the region from European Russia between 1895 and 1916, often known as the Great Siberian Migration. Almost all of this was done on the Trans-Siberian Railway. That's what really made this whole thing possible. It was the goal, after all, make it a bit more Russian. The, one of the goals. The figure represented 57% of all migrants heading to Siberia and the Russian Far East since 1796, in much the same way as the pioneers heading west in the United States. A new life in the Russian Far East was seen as preferable by many to the increasing hardships in Western Russia, where living conditions in the larger cities could be truly appalling. The promise of cheap land and the dream of a new start was enough for millions to pack their bags and travel along the Trans-Siberian. The Siberian economy also exploded, which in turn drew even more people east. The vast open space with its notably rich black earth provided excellent farming land, and Siberia quickly became one of Russia's main breadbaskets. The butter industry went from non-existent to the second biggest producer in the world behind Denmark, while many towns, which lay on the line, saw the kind of growth that transforms them from poor provincial villages to booming towns in less than a decade. Now, none of this would have been possible without the Trans-Siberian. Not only did it connect Russia, but it also helped to build Russia.
Much has changed aboard the Trans-Siberian Express. First class on the original train was quite simply lavish. There were marble-tiled bathrooms, a grand piano in the music room, a library, and a gym. And of course, there was plenty of caviar and champagne. Sounds pretty amazing. However, the lower classes, less nice. Third class carriages carried cargo along with many peasants looking to use the service as simply a form of transportation rather than an extravagant journey. These carriages were cramped, uncomfortable, and depending on the season, either incredibly hot or unbearably cold. The train was also much slower back then and ambled along at just 20 miles per hour, taking nearly four weeks to complete the journey. If you remember from earlier, today it takes just seven days. Things are different nowadays. Today the trains are divided into first class cabins with two beds in them and second class, which can accommodate four people. There is also a third class, which is essentially a seat that can be lowered into a bed in an open carriage. Though they are a far cry from the opulence of the early 20th century, the trains are clean, comfortable, and importantly, well, heated and cool season dependent. Now, it's not in the script here, but I do believe there is a fancy train that will run on the Trans-Siberian route, but it's enormously expensive. It's not like the uh, official one. It's run by a private company. I'm not sure about that. It might be run by Pullman, maybe. I feel like I looked into this and then it was insanely expensive and I was like, yeah, it's too expensive. <laughs> Considering how long it takes, or maybe because of it, we're not really sure, the Trans-Siberian isn't too expensive for the public train that must be. A one-way trip from Moscow to Vladivostok would set you back around $138 for a third-class seat, $315 for a second-class seat, and $617 for a first-class ticket. It's a little difficult to make comparisons here because there obviously isn't anything quite like it in the world, but for the sake of it, let's look at the journey from New York to San Francisco aboard an Amtrak train. At around 3,000 miles, it's no slouch of a journey, it would cost you about $250, and that's just for a seat, not a bed. It's going to be a seriously uncomfortable journey. The railway uses 1,520 millimeter, that's 4 foot 11 inch track gauge, slightly larger than what has become the standard around the world, which is 1,435 millimeters. And I was, I was reading the script before I did the recording today, and I'm like, can't we just say 1.435 meters? And Ollie, who writes the script, was like, Simon, apparently, Apparently the official thing is millimeters. And I was like, okay, just leave it then. Weird though. To make things slightly more complicated, this applies to the lines running through Russia and Mongolia, but not within China, which does use the smaller gauge. Each time the train passes across the border, it needs to be lifted and the gauge below it has to be changed before it can continue. But let's move away from the present and take a look at the history of this remarkable project, because it is the many fascinating stories that have occurred along the route which really make it unique. The 20th century was a turbulent time for Russia, you certainly know that, and the Trans-Siberian certainly played its part. You might even say that it helped start a war. One nation which did not welcome the construction of the railway across Russia was Japan. Until then, Japan had been more than happy to see Russia focus much of its attention on the West and Europe. The construction of the Trans-Siberian changed all that, and the development of the Trans Manchurian worried the Japanese even further. The area of Manchuria was a northeastern province in China, but one that had been eyed by both the Russians and the Japanese for potential expansion for many years. In 1900, the Russians sent troops along the Trans-Siberian and into Manchuria, occupying the entire province. Tensions between the Russians and the Japanese grew over the coming years before exploding in 1904. The Russo-Japanese War was nothing short of disastrous for Russia, and it painfully exposed the limitations of the Trans-Siberian. At this point, it was still a single trans line, which meant significant delays and limits on traffic. The time that it took Russia to bring reinforcements to the front hampered their efforts and eventually heavily contributed to their defeat. During the Russian Civil War, the railway also played a vital role in communication, especially for the white Russian government, the anti-communist forces. It enabled support to move quickly, but after communist fighters began to sabotage parts of the line, it sped up the defeat of the white Russian government and, well, the emergence of Soviet rule. In 1920, two of the Khabarovsk Bridge's 18 metal supporting spans were blown up by pro-communist guerrilla fighters. This was an act that didn't quite destroy the bridge, but one that put it out of action for the next five years. It reopened again in 1920 and the Trans-Siberian was again fully connected. But all of this was just the appetizer to the chaos that was to ensue during World War II. During the first two years of the war, the Soviet Union, as the area was now known, had signed a military non-aggression pact with Nazi Germany. While much of Germany's merchant navy was intercepted by the Allies, the Trans-Siberian emerged as a key trading link between Japan and Germany. Rubber in particular was in high demand in Europe and handily something Japan could find plenty of in the East. By 1941, around 300 tons of this and 
other material made its way along the Trans-Siberian every single day. The line was also heavily used by passengers, often with vastly differing ideologies. Several thousand Jewish refugees were able to flee Europe along the Trans-Siberian to Vladivostok before boarding ships bound for America. Conversely, native Germans residing in the Americas, looking to get back their homeland, also made their way along the railway, but in the opposite direction. Everything changed on the 21st of June 1941 when Germany invaded the Soviet Union. The Trans-Siberian remains the safest route between the USA and the USSR, and military aid, as well as food, began pouring along the route after being shipped across the Pacific. As things deteriorated for the Soviets, the line was heavily involved in relocating industries out of Western Russia to the safer Siberian region. It also became vital towards the end of 1941 when the Soviets launched their huge counteroffensive, which saved Moscow and eventually halted the Nazi surge through Russia. But you definitely know that. Today, the line continues to be a vital artery across Russia, transporting around 30% of the country's exports along its route at some point. The last few decades have seen a dramatic increase in trade between China and Europe along the Trans-Siberian. But it might not last. A new Trans-Caspian route, which passes through Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, now offers a direct challenge to the Trans-Siberian, which, in truth, is struggling to expand its service. Chinese authorities have become increasingly frustrated with the slow speed of the trains across Russia and also the lack of growth. While the Chinese market is booming and seems hell-bent on pushing export numbers as high as possible, the rail network across Russia is just struggling to keep up. It's also not a particularly cheap option either. A standard 20-foot container costs between $8,000 and $9,000 to transport along the Trans-Siberian to Europe, while the same journey done by sea costs $1,000 to $2,000. So, you know, which one are they going to choose? That's a huge difference in price. But foreign passenger numbers along the Trans-Siberian have never been higher. A recent peak in 2015 recorded 26.9 million foreign visitors using the line. While things may not be completely rosy with trade along the Trans-Siberian, it hasn't stopped plans for a truly bold extension. In 2016, the Japanese government announced tentative plans to connect the Trans-Siberian with the Japanese island of Hokkaido, the most northern of Japan's islands, which is just 28 miles from the Russian island of Sakhalin. This island is very close to the Russian mainland. It was, of course, an idea that needed Russian cooperation. The two governments have since engaged in preliminary planning, which would dramatically increase the size of the largest rail line that the world has ever seen. Initial plans have been called for two bridges to be built. The first would span somewhere on the Russian mainland to Sakhalin, which is 6.2 miles at its shortest distance. The second would be a 28-mile bridge from Sakhalin to Hokkaido. From there, it's just five hours to the Japanese capital of Tokyo. So. I remember how at the beginning I was impressed that you could get to Beijing from Moscow? Imagine being able to get to Tokyo. Incredible. But this would simply be the culmination, or maybe the start, depending on the direction, of an extraordinary journey. The grand plan is to eventually link London with Tokyo, with a titanic 8,400-mile journey in between. This would likely be done with a series of trains scheduled in a way that the journey could be done as seamlessly as possible. The project has been dubbed the Bridge Across History, referring to the lingering tension between Japan and Russia that has remained since World War II, and the hope that such a historic project may help to foster closer friendships. I wonder if you could do that journey now. Could you get from London all the way to the end of the Trans-Siberian just on trains? I bet you could. I bet you could. You'd definitely have to change a lot, and it would be a massive hassle. But you could probably do it. If anyone's done it, I mean, this channel gets a few views these days, let me know in the comments below. At the moment, this is just an idea, but what a tantalizing idea it is. The Trans-Siberian is both a magnificent engineering achievement and a once-in-a-lifetime experience for many. It united the largest country in the world, but also provided the lifeline that has enabled Siberia and the Russian Far East to thrive. Mega projects, they come and go, but rarely do we see one that has woven itself into the very tapestry of a country and its people, quite like the Trans-Siberian Express. So, I really hope you enjoyed that video. Uh, if you did, you know what to do. Smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, support our sponsors like Skillshare, who make this joyous video possible. <laughs> they are linked to below. And thank you for watching.